Uh, I'm just calling now the next speaker. Uh, it's uh, Kurt Bauer from the Austrian Railways. Please uh, join me. Let's welcome uh, Kurt to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we already had two very interesting speeches, and I would like to relate to both a little bit before I start my presentation, because we have already experienced two very interesting things here. The first one was from the Slovak colleagues, where they really put the cooperation between railways in the front of their presentation. And this product to split is our joint product, uh, and this is how we as ÖBB really do all of our international products. We work together with our partners. We do not try to do it on our own, because a lot of companies are much more experienced in their home country. If we look now into the Netherlands, for example, we closely cooperate with Dutch railways in order to produce the night train from Amsterdam to Zurich and from Amsterdam to Innsbruck and Vienna. So that was the first important message of this afternoon, I think. Cooperation is the way for a successful product for our passengers. The second thing was also very interesting, reservation system. It's not particularly in my presentation, but the reservation touch point for the customer is so important. And people get annoyed if they are not able to reserve, if they cannot see what they reserve. They will stop purchasing this product. That's why I really like the presentation of the VIA colleagues because the reservation touch point is crucial for an attractive transport offer, rail offer, not only to Austrians, by the way, but to everybody in Europe. So let's start with my presentation. And um, even so, it might sound a little bit old fashioned, but at the end of the day, one of the most important features is the timetable. People choose the rail because they get a good connection from where they want to go uh, from where they want to start to where they want to go. And this is something, again, which a railway cannot do on its own. What you see here is a 20-year process between railways, infrastructure managers, and policy makers. There is not one single way to success to produce an interval timetable if you do not have partners in policy makers and infrastructure management. The best example in Europe is the Swiss Railways, which developed this system for the last 40 years. But this is a crucial way to get more passengers on rail. And what you see here is one of the main reasons why the Austrian population is the one which travels most in railways in the European Union. In Europe, only the Swiss are the first, uh, are the first and in the European Union, it's the Austrians. And this is especially remarkable because our country is not really a railway country by geography. We've got a lot of mountains, quite long distances, quite slow services, and yet the Austrians are the ones which travel most in the European Union. And the reason, one of the main reasons, it's not fancy trains, it's not, I don't know, special offers, it's really the timetable. The second important thing to attract people to rail is really making rail more accessible. And I think this mobility as a service, there are a lot of different speeches in the next few days and, and yesterday how to achieve that. But it cannot be underestimated how important it is to make the rail accessible by other modes of transport. And people get more flexible. They ask for new solutions, digitalized solutions. So this is definitely a very, very crucial way to attract more passengers to the final rail services. As I was saying, I think there are more experts here in this room and in the other rooms which will speak about mobility as a service, but that's another really crucial thing to do. So that was too quick. What is really a unique thing to the rail business is really the coaches and the rolling stock. And um, one thing is for sure, the closest contact people have with the rail travel is the seat or is the environment on board of our train. So the environment on board of the train cannot be underestimated how important it is that people feel safe, feel comfortable, um, and, and, and really enjoy the train at uh, the time on the train. Um, we already had 
the presentation this uh, morning or yesterday, I think, about our new night trains. There are, again, some pictures which show our solutions. But I would rather stay, as we spoke about the night trains already in different sessions, I would really like to stay a little bit with the design of the day trains. A day train is much more than a first or a second class seat. A day train is going to the restaurant for a meal, having an onboard portal where you have entertainment and news, having different seating areas, different areas for families, for business travelers, like you can see here, our business compartments. So if you, on the long run, want to keep people using the railways, for each customer, you need to find the right environment. Um, we have worked here together with Prism and Good. Prism and Good is also outside, they have a stand here. And we approached the industry and the purchasing of rolling stock in a completely new way. Because what you normally do is you look what's on the market, do a little bit of specification about the colors, and then you purchase what's on the market. And we really began our designing process from the customer. I'll give you only two examples. Um, we were sitting in the trains and really watching where people have problems. And one thing which was quite obvious is people always have the problem heavy luggage to put on the back, uh, baggage racks. So what we came up as a conclusion is we introduced raised seating, which means you sit a little bit higher, like 20 centimeters higher, and there's enough space to store your luggage underneath your seat, which has a double effect. People feel safe because they sit on their luggage, because if you've got these ordinary back racks, people are sometimes scared that it gets stolen. Also, it basically never gets stolen. This is really something which is not a problem in reality, but it's a felt problem, and that's how you have to, to solve it. And um, the second thing is, as I was mentioning, the seating. We designed a new seat for our customers, together with Prism and Good, together with the Technical University of Munich. So if you want to make a real difference to your product, as a railway company, you have to go your own way and find your own solutions. That's a clear message here if it comes to rolling stock. Another important thing, and I think this is something which probably has not yet been discussed here that much, is the pricing system. Um, and you have different kind of travelers. Like you can see here on the right hand, uh, this is our Sparschiene, which is our special price, um, where you can have really, really good deals as on the day trains as well as on the night jet. And for that, you need a good yield management system. And we're again now coming to the IT side of the business. The reservation system was already mentioned. Another big issue is the yield management system for railways. This is a highly sophisticated thing and unfortunately much more difficult than for the aviation industry because the aviation industry typically has only two or three com comfort categories and a limited number of origins and de destinations. You cannot change the plane really, you only change once maximum. If you take a railway network, it gets much more complex. So in order to offer this, from a customer point of view, very easy product, a cheap price for trains which are not heavily used or loaded, you need a lot of sophisticated ID in the backyard, uh, in, the, in the background. And if you take the night train into account, it gets even more difficult because a night train has so many different ca categories. We've got sleeper, crochet, seating coach four or six crochet, one, two or three sleeping compartments, female compartments, you, uh, yielding auto trains, car trains, this all has to be done in this um, yielding system. So reservation system is very complex. I would say yielding is even more complex in a way, but that's what you need to get travelers which are not using rail that much and which are rare, very price sensitive. On the other extreme, we've got the Klima ticket in Austria for a year now. A Klima ticket has been introduced by the Ministry of Transport. It is a ticket which costs 1,095 euros per year, which is three euros per day at the moment, and you can use all public transport in Austria. So from the underground train to the high-speed train, you can use every train. This is a political um, approach in order to fight 
climate change, and it is strengthening the public transport system in general. We've got, we, we saw a similar, this was more like a trial in Germany with the nine euro ticket in summer, and now they convert it into a 49 euro ticket for all regional trains and public services. I truly believe this is a way forward, which we as taxpayers, we have to fund it, that's clear, it's not for free, but I think the positive effects of such a product are much higher than what we as a taxpayer really have to invest into the system. So if you want to encourage people to use the train, make the system accessible from, as I was saying, a physical world, and make it accessible if it comes to sales and distribution and ticketing. I didn't get really into detail here in the sales and uh, distribution, but it's another really critical point where you need digitalization on the one hand, but user friendliness on the other side to get more people on the railways. Now I get to my last slide, um, and this is something which really is un unique to Austria, that is the international connectivity. Every second long distance train of ÖBB is an international train, every second train. Um, why is that? From the one hand, it is from uh, the geographical shape of Austria. We are a transit country in a lot of respects. That's one thing. The second thing is we are so close to other highly populated areas, like I go back to, the Czech, uh, to, to Slovakia, Bratislava is less than 100 kilometers away from Vienna. We have every half hour a train to Bratislava. This would, is only possible because of the cooperation with, with Slovak railways again. Um, so that's the second thing, we, especially Vienna is so close to our eastern neighbors uh, that it is only a logical consequence to do these international services. Third, it's again also a clear political commitment from our policymakers. So our night trains in Austria, most of them run under a public service obligation, so a public, a public service contract. So we need to achieve this, a clear support from policymakers, and also some money is necessary in order to achieve this network. And what we can see is that people really appreciate it. Um, the international trains were those which grew most, where, uh, where passengers and travelers grew most post-pandemic in this summer. We have in some cases 50% more travelers on international trains than we used to have before COVID in 2019. So there is a real demand for international services. And if there are any railway operators sitting here now, it is a joint effort and again and again, I can only mention it, it's a cooperation approach which we need as European railways in order to even extend this, what we see here from an Austrian perspective, I would be so happy if we would see this in other countries as well, this well connectivity to our European neighbors. So that was a very quick overview on the one hand quite general, on the other hand, I think I touched the main points and we need to get in each of those points into more details um, if we really want to make the railways even a greater success as they are today. Thank you very much for listening to me. Cool, thank you very much. Thank you very